thing is a bit unfamiliar to you, but what I hope you realize is from our hearts, we're, we're worshiping a God that he's changed us, he's saved us, he's given us a whole new life. Amen, church? And it's just from our hearts we love to worship him and tell him how good he is. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you, worship team. And kids, you may be dismissed for Kids Church this morning. Thank you to Anna and Sally who are teaching this morning. Have an awesome time. Elementary, preschool kids, toddlers, have an awesome morning. And for the rest of us, if you've got your Bible, would you turn with me to John chapter 7? And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one at the end of the service. And uh, if you ask for one at the Welcome Center uh, at the end, we'd love to get a Bible in your hands uh, because we know God's Word changes us. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good. It's been a good morning at church, and I'm looking forward to sharing this Word with you this morning uh, as well. We're starting a new sermon series today uh, called Flow. And... uh, and I think, well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it over these next couple of weeks. The Lord put this uh, topic on my heart in, in January, and it's just kind of been waiting for the time to, to slot it in. And so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at this idea uh, that I, I want to unpack today and just kind of lay the groundwork for where we're going in the next couple of weeks. Um, but as we do that, I wanted just to kind of begin, I, I don't know about you, I was driving in today, uh, this morning into service, and like, we are, we are spoiled to live where we live. Can I get an amen on that? You know, we, we are just so, we have this like, we're, we've been placed in this part of the world that is just so ridiculously beautiful. I don't know about you, but like, I, I, every day I commute back and forth from Willow Point to here, and so what do I get to do? I get to drive by the ocean every single day multiple times a day, and it always seems to look different. The lighting, the waves, the whole thing, it's just, we're so blessed. And, and one of the reasons why this place we call home is so beautiful is because all the water everywhere, whether it's falling from the sky or flowing down the Campbell River, one of the reasons it's just so incredible is because of water. And, and it's so funny, we... Um, Deanna and I have, been, have lived now in Campbell River since uh, 2010, right? Let's look to Sarah for confirmation in the front row. So almost nine years now. And it took us like eight years almost to finally do the Canyon View Trail, which I, I don't know how that happened, uh, that how it possibly took us so long to finally, everyone had said it was amazing, maybe because we always had little babies in tow, and so we're like, that'd be hard. So even the first time we did it, we did the Canyon View Trail thinking we could do this with a buggy. And about like the 40th stair that we got our way up, we abandoned the buggy and kept going. But uh, it, it's a beautiful hike. If you haven't done it, you should do it. Like this afternoon, is you really, that should be your application to today's sermon, is, is go do the Elk Ball or Canyon View Trail. But one reason it's so incredible is because there's just life everywhere. It's thick and dense life. There's flowers and plants and a whole bunch of trees and and salmon in the river that people pay big money and come from all over the place to swim with our salmon. Like, think about how blessed we are. Like, we could live in Saskatchewan or something like that, which has its own beauty, so I'm not trying to offend any Saskatchewan people. Deanna came from Saskatchewan, and her family escaped in, in uh, <laughs> their words, not mine, okay? <laughs> their words. But we have people come all over the place, and, and like e- even our river is a beautiful example of it. It's just this place of life. And no wonder we had, even our first, uh, the First Nations community came and lived in such a place like this because life is everywhere. And, and what I want to begin to talk about today is that even in the natural world, when you have flow, you have life. One of the reasons that there's so much life around the river is because the water is moving. And it's carrying nutrients, it's carrying oxygen and all these things. And so plants gather and grow and thrive and grow tall and all these things happen because when you have flow, you have life. Same thing in our bodies. If, if, you have, if you don't have flow going on in your body, you have some big problems, 
right? Like, I, I, again, not to be gory or anything like that, but, you know, you probably have met people. I know people that have had, had bad circulation in certain parts of their body. And you get all sorts of issues when the things aren't flowing the way they should be flowing. Because when there's flow, there's life. And it's not just a picture in the natural. It's also a spiritual reality that when there's flow, there's life. And the opposite is also true. When there's no flow, there's no life. If the blood stops flowing in my veins, what will happen to me very quickly? I'll die. And, you know, I'll go see Jesus. But anyways, you know, at least my physical body will die if the flow stops, if the blood stops flowing. Same thing in the natural environment around us. If water doesn't flow, it gets gross. Stagnant water is nasty. I, and I didn't need to do research, but I did anyways on, the, on stagnant water. Like malaria and bacteria and all nasty sorts of things grow in stagnant water. It's not, it, there's, yes, there's some stuff living in there, but even animals know not to drink out of that. Here's a, here's a picture. This is a place in the Okanagan. It's called uh, Spotted Lake, which I've never seen in person. But I was trying to find... Normally in a sermon like this, I would talk about the Dead Sea in Israel where the water all flows in and it doesn't leave. And so now you can float in the salt water of the Dead Sea. But I wanted a more Canadian example. And so this is the Spotted Lake in the Okanagan just outside of Osoyoos. Osoyoos is in the Okan That's Okanagan, right? Anyway, we'll go with it. Outside of Osoyoos. And so this is a unique lake in Canada and actually fairly unique around the world. And the problem with, well, first you see all those spots everywhere. And apparently throughout the summer, the spot's color can change and vary depending on the different mineral compositions of all those little, like, spots of, of water. Kind of cool. Anyone who's seen this in person? Some people in the first service had been out there. Okay, not sec. We need to travel second service. But, uh, <laughs> but here's, the, it's the interesting thing. What creates this dynamic is that water flows in, but there is no way for water to leave other than evaporation. So again, moving water moves oxygen, minerals, all these things. So all of that flows into this lake, but it's like a bowl, and then it stays there and has nowhere to go except for evaporation. And so throughout the summer, the water dries, and, and all the mineral concentration gets higher and higher and higher and higher. Guess what you don't do in this lake? Swim, fish, drink, why? Because there's no flow. And now I'm sure if some, some people might be a bit technical and you'd be like, yeah, but Pastor Matt, there's some bacteria that I'm sure lives in that warm pool of water. Okay, sure. But it's certainly not abundant life. There might be some form of life that just holds on in that hostile environment. But man, it's not an oasis of like, let's go hang out there. There's some benefit to the minerals. Sure. But it's not a picture of life. If you need a picture of life, go to the Campbell River. Again, flow makes a difference. And when things don't flow, you get problems. And you can get, end up with death even if things don't flow. So why are we talking about this? We see in the natural that when there's flow, there's life. And, and this picture then, let's kind of bridge it into the Bible, is a very scriptural picture, particularly of rivers. And it's neat, I was looking into this this week and starting to study this out, and I was looking at both ends of the Bible use the same metaphor, and actually not a metaphor, talking about reality. Genesis chapter 2, the Bible tells us God created everything, amen? Like there's uh, Bible 101, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And what he does is he makes then Adam and Eve, and he makes them a garden called Eden for them to live in. And if you need any indication that God is good and loving, is that he made a perfect world for them to live in. It wasn't some terrible, hostile environment where God is like, make her work, suck it up. No, no, no. He made them a garden that was beautiful, full of life, fruit trees, and all these sorts of things. And if you have a good garden, what do you need? Water. Right? Right? Again, this is basic, but it, so even in Genesis, it, it describes to us in Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, it says that a river flowed out of Eden, the garden, to water the garden. 
and there it divided and became four rivers. So again, why mention it? Well, the Bible is using this picture to talk about, yes, the garden, but that river then allowed the tree of life to grow. So I just like that picture. This flowing river then leads to life. And then if we skip all the way to the end of the Bible, Revelations chapter 21, or sorry, Revelation chapter 22, it tells us there, talking about the new heaven and the new earth that God will make for those that love him when he takes us to be with him for all eternity. The Bible tells us in Revelation 22, there's also a river there. And it says, when the angel showed me, the writer of Revelation, the river of water of life, bright as crystal. Man, that's pretty. We got pretty rivers here, but this has got to be even better than that flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb. The next verse, it says uh, in verse 2, through the middle of the street, this river flowed uh, of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Again, we could preach out of that verse in and of itself. But what am I highlighting again is that in the Bible, this picture of flowing water represents life. And where life flows, the tree of life grows. And there's all these amazing things that take place. Where there's flow, there's life. And where these kinds of rivers happen, there's life. And I want to point out for us something here too. The big picture of the Bible from the beginning to the end, here is this amazing picture God sets up humanity in a garden. He makes it perfect and lovely and waters it with a river. There's a tree of life. There's this suggestion that Adam and Eve would have lived with God forever in perfection and relationship with Him. But then sin enters. They rebel against God and sin ruins everything. And, and so they're cast out of God's presence. He kicks them out of the garden. And, and then we get the whole story of the Bible. And now we skip over to the end in Revelation. And what does God do again? He makes another river. He restores. He redeems what he always wanted. He brings it to pass. And now leading to eternal life for everybody. You know what that tells me? God is consistently in the business of bringing life to people. Sometimes we can get this idea of God. He's angry. He's mad. He's ready to throw a lightning bolt at any minute. But here's the thing. The Bible paints a picture that God wants people to live. And let's personalize it. God wants you to live an abundant life. And if we're even unsure about that, we're like, maybe you're just drawing that a little bit out of those rivers in Genesis and Revelation. John 10.10, 10, Jesus came so that we could have life and life more abundantly. This is the heart of God for people. And so one of the reasons we're going to talk about flow over the next few weeks is because God wants you to live in abundance of life. But we've got to do life on his terms in order to live that way. God made it, he makes it clear for us on how we should live so we can live that kind of life. And one of the things that we need to allow God to do in us is help us to understand the spiritual principle of flow. And so what I want to do is I want to look at John chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. I think I mentioned that a while back, and so here we go. Flow. What am I really talking about? Uh, I want to read this, uh, this passage of Scripture, and, and, and I think it's an example of this principle of flow. Uh, John 7, verse 37 says this. And again, if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you one at the end of the service. It's a welcome center on the back. We'll put one in your hand, no cost, because uh, we just love people to get God's Word. And so John 7, 37 says this, On the last day of the feast, the great day, and the feast here is talking about the Passover. It was a Jewish festival, a Jewish high holiday. They would have gathered from all over the place into a city called Jerusalem, Jews from all over Israel, and Jesus was there. And he stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. What an amazing thing for Jesus to say. If anyone's thirsty, now do you think he's talking literal, can you hand me a cup of lemon water, please? Well, no. He's talking about a metaphor, but we all get it. In our lives, there are times where in our spirits and our souls, we are thirsty for more. We feel dry. There's something missing. And Jesus then sets out this offer. Come to me 
and drink. It's just this amazing invitation for everyone that would hear it. When we come to Jesus, we're offered water, living water. But here's the thing that I want to point out in this idea of flow. If we come to Jesus and drink, it's an input. Everyone say input. Input. So if you're going to have flow, you've got to have first some input. And Jesus is that source. Jesus is the one we go to, and he puts things into our lives. He blesses us. The Bible tells us that if you're a believer, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. God wants to put something on the inside of you, but here's the next part of that passage we were looking in John 7. It says in verse 38, Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart, everyone say output, will flow rivers of living water. Now this he has said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, yet, as for, yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. We're going to come back next week, I think, and talk about the role of the Holy Spirit being filled and flowing out. But what I want to identify today is, again, the basic principle. There are inputs from the Lord, and what He puts in you, He wants to flow out of you. That's flow. In and out. And when there's flow, there's life. God wants you to walk in life. But sometimes in our lives, we can get caught and we can get our, our equation of input and output mixed up. Sometimes we're not receiving from the Lord. If you've not yet made a decision to make Jesus the Lord and the leader of your life, well, there are things that you've never received from Him if you've never come to Jesus, right? And if you've got nothing from the Lord, you then have nothing to give out. But here's the good news, is that even if today was the first day you ever heard about Jesus, His invitation still stands. Come to me, all who are thirsty, and drink. What's He really talking about is that there are things and longings on the inside of us. There is a sin condition that will never be solved by anything we could run after in this world. No pleasure, no, no substance, no habit will fulfill that hole in our heart. But when we go and respond to Jesus, when we come to Him and drink, we get this amazing input called salvation. It's life. But again, if there's no input, there can't be any output. What happens when you don't get any input? You become a desert. Think of the sandiest sand dune you can imagine. The problem is, is there's just nothing coming. And so then, therefore, there can be no life. So the way that we get to the source, the way we get that input is we come to Jesus. And how do we come to Jesus? We respond to Him in faith. We, we believe the words that we've heard said about Him. We say, I believe them. Jesus rose from the dead. We make him the leader of our life. And then, then we start getting some inputs from, from heaven, from Jesus. And so first, we got to make sure we're getting some input. The other problems that happen is that we might be getting some input. Maybe we're a Christian and God's done stuff for us. But then for one reason or the other, we stop the flow. And we just keep receiving and receiving. And we think the Christian life is just coming to Jesus. And Jesus, give me more. I want more, 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 more for me, 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 me. But again, what happens when you just keep inputting? Think of your natural body. If you just keep inputting, 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 and there's no output anywhere, you're going to be super uncomfortable and things are not going to happen very good for you, are they? But sometimes, again, as believers, we can be receiving, but we, we stop and we don't have any output. Maybe we think, well, God's done stuff for me, but, but I couldn't share that with somebody else because, you know, I'm not mature enough or I'm not ready or God hasn't done this thing for me yet. And so we just kind of hold on to everything God's done for us and we don't let any of it out. That's not a place where we'll walk in life. If, we, if that happens to us, if we get input but no output, we become like the spotted lake. It's not abundance of life. Maybe there's some life hanging on in there somewhere, somehow. Some biology person can come talk to me later about how things live in that sort of condition. But, we, you know, the abundance of life it doesn't exist when we just keep getting and getting and getting and there's no output. And then we might have other problems. Maybe, maybe we're actually in the place where we're receiving from the Lord. 
but we keep giving out and we just, we're so, we keep giving out so much. Like we just keep, and then we, not, not, we don't come back to Jesus to get more. We can be in that place too where we just kind of run dry and, and then we're like, we're needing more and God wants to give more. But So there's this balance that we're going to talk about over these next few weeks called flow where we're receiving from Jesus and we're letting it out. But the thing I want to emphasize today is this. We're going to talk in the next couple of weeks about some of the ways we output. We're going to get there. But today I do want to highlight for you that God, if you're a Christian here, God already has deposited things on the inside of you that he wants you to let out. But again, sometimes we can be like, well, I've got nothing to give. Well, if you're a believer, you sure do. And I want to encourage you, I want to show you from the word today how we can begin to look at our lives perhaps in a different way and begin to see how God has worked. And if God has done something in you, he wants to do it through you. I know it's kind of a phrase we can throw around a lot, but the, we need to say it We need to because we need to live that if we want to walk in life. What he does in you, he wants to then also do through you. If you've got your Bibles, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to show you another example of this principle of flow that happens in the Bible. And another way for us to see where what God puts in you, he wants to work out of you. But we first have to recognize he's, he's done something. He's put something in you. Uh, we got we to gotta identify that first. I can't let something out if I don't even know it's there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. What's Paul saying here? He received an input of comfort. And because he'd received comfort, what could he now give? Comfort. Flow. Let's keep reading just because it's a really good passage of Scripture. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through God we share abundantly in comfort too. I love this. God meets them in proportion to what they were walking through. What's the affliction he's talking about? Well, let's keep, let's keep reading. We'll come back to that. If we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in, in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Paul's talking about some of the persecutions that he faced for being a Christian. Because he chose to follow Jesus, there's things that didn't work out well for him. And who knows? And so like, again, we could share it if we had more time. Times in our lives where because we've made choices to follow Jesus, that, that always doesn't necessarily work out when that offends people or all that sort of stuff. But now Paul's talking about affliction, like being beaten and stoned and thrown in jail and all these sorts of things. But look at, even in those hard moments, Jesus is there putting inputs into Paul's heart. Paul's suffering and God is there and he shows up and he flows comfort into his heart. And then Paul recognizes something amazing, that even in his difficulty, even in his hardest moments, God is putting something in that gets to come out. This amazing reality that Paul now sees life in a di totally different way. Think about this like this. In our consumeristic world that we live in, which I don't think I need to lay down the reasons I think that we live in a consumer culture, right? Like, get, take it for granted. We want stuff. Give me stuff. Give me stuff. Give me stuff. And when we do that, most often, who are we thinking about? Us. My comfort, my want, my need, all this sort of stuff. But here's this thing. When we, when we l operate in this biblical principle called flow, we recognize the very thing God puts in me, is it for me? Yes, but not just for me. 
God gives stuff to us so that he, we have something to give to others. And I think some, a supernatural miracle can also take place. In John 7, when Jesus said, come to me and drink, I get a picture in my mind, maybe you do too, of a cup of water. <laughs> drink. But what happens to those that drink from Jesus? What comes out of them? A river of living water. Not just like a cup. <laughs> but there's this, there's this multiplication that takes place. I think Paul alludes to it here too. He had an abundance of suffering, and so what does he get? An abundance of comfort. And that means there's more than enough comfort to share. Do you see the thought that, that, that for, the, for a Christian, what shifts in our minds? When God does something for me, it, again, it shifts us out of selfishness, which we know doesn't lead any of us to life. And automatically puts me now in a place of, God, you're so good. You healed me from that. Now I get to share that with somebody else. God, you brought me comfort in my dif difficult situation. I'm going to share it with somebody else. God, you brought me encouragement when I needed it. God, you brought me hope when I needed hope. But it's, thank you, Lord, it's not just for me. I get to share it with someone else. That's when flow begins to operate in our lives. We get set up to live life because if life is all about us, it's not really living, is it? We, we find life when we serve, and I love it. God sets stuff in us so that he enables us to do that. And then we have something to offer because here's the thing. In the natural, by ourselves, in our own strength, in our own smarts, we don't have all that much to offer. Like, can I tell you that as your, as your pastor... I don't got that much to give. But when we let God put something inside of us and we let that out, man, that's when stuff starts to happen. And God wants you to know that he's put stuff in you. Even in the difficult moments, God is working in you and putting stuff in you, whether it's patience or perseverance or, or strength or resolve. You know, I, again, I don't want to get into the debate of does God bring you that difficult situation to teach you the lesson. You know, again, that's a whole other debate for another time. But the reality is God takes bad and makes good come out of it. And one of the ways he does that is that even in your darkest moments, in your failures and your trials, he's putting stuff in you to let out of you. And so here's the good news about that. Sometimes we might think, I'm, I'm not mature enough to like share with somebody else. I, I don't have a Bible college degree. How am I supposed to do all those sorts of silly things? I'm not saying Bible college is silly, but I'm saying that idea that I need to have some super attainment of maturity or intelligence, then I can give? No. Once God's done something in you, you have something to flow out. And it's the enemy that's trying to convince you you don't have anything to give. Why? Because if, if the enemy can get you to not give, then he stops the flow. And he's going to short-circuit life in you because I've got nothing to give. Who am I to give? Why? I can't go and tell that person that thing. Do they, do, you know, who, do they, who do I think I am? And the enemy wants to come and jump on us and point out all of our flaws. Today what I'm wanting is that the Holy Spirit will identify in you what God's already done. What is it? Is it hope? Has God brought you healing? Has God brought you wisdom? Has he brought you faithfulness, perseverance? I don't know. Oh, the list goes on of all the things that God has put in you. Start there. Once it's in, it can come out. Don't wait for God to do the big thing you've been waiting for him to do. Although I believe we should be per persistent and believe for those things. But let's start to give out of all that he's already given. Do you see the shift in our minds that we've got to let flow happen? And we might as well start now. Be faithful in the small thing. Maybe you think, oh, the little thing God did in me is such a little thing. That, why can I even share that? Be faithful with the small thing. And then see God as he multiplies, as it, in, it multiplies it and increases that in your life. Again, I wonder, and I don't wonder actually, but I'm going to put phrase it that way. 
Are there people, circumstances, and even in your own life where God is wanting life to be abundant and perhaps the thing standing in the way is we haven't recognized that there was something for us to give so we never gave it. Now maybe you do know you have something to give and you haven't given it yet. Well, God wants that life to flow, so let it out. Let it flow. So the thing that I want to highlight today is we lay down this principle. When there's flow, there's life. And so what God is wanting us to know and to hear afresh today is that you have something to offer, not because of you, but because what if he has inputted in you. And so let's let it out. And so the thing that I want to do over the next couple of weeks is, is encourage us in some practical ways. What does this look like in the life of a believer? We're going to look at things like spiritual gifts. We'll look at things like finances, ways, areas of our lives where God's wanting this thing to happen in, bo- in good proportion and good measure, in and out, in and out, and then this multiplied out that he's got for us. So today, but the thing I want to do is, is I want to come back again to John chapter 7 where Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Maybe another way to say that for us, Deanna, Gwen, if you guys could come, would be awesome, is this dynamic that we need to, if, we, if we're going to want something to flow out, we need to get something on the inside. And, and so I like the picture. I, I can't even imagine the Campbell River. I don't know where the headwaters of the Campbell River is. Maybe somebody does know where that is. If you just trace it back, it's got to start somewhere, right? And in the life of a believer, where is the headwater of the stuff that flows out of us? It's the person of Jesus. He is the living water. No joke, I was reading through some materials this week and studying out this passage, and there were some theologians that were debating whether, you know, this passage is interesting. Does it mean, suggest that the believers with rivers of living water flowing out of them, are they the source of life and all these? And they're kind of doing this back and forth, and I'm like, they're totally missing the point. Sometimes we get caught up in the details of a thing and miss the thing that God's wanting to say. Let it out. Because ultimately we know he's the source. He is the giver of every good thing. But here's this cool dynamic in our lives. When I've been so filled with what the Lord wants to give me, I then get to be this, this person that gets to go and share that with others. And the person I share that with might think it was from me when I know it wasn't. And at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters. I'm not going to take credit for something that's not mine. But I'm not going to let the worry about the debate on that stop me from sharing what God's put on the inside of me. So what I want to do this morning is I want to give us some opportunity for us just to respond to Jesus' invitation, come and drink. I wonder if there's anyone thirsty here this morning. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that's feeling a bit dry. The invitation still stands. Jesus says, come to me and drink. Are you thirsty? You, if you need an input, today I want to give us some moments, some time for us to just be in the presence of the Lord. I preach real short today, guys. We have a lot of extra time. No worries about it. But this is what I want to do in particular. I do want to give us some really practical opportunity. We did this in the first service, and part of it came out of a response to what we prayed about in our pre-service prayer way early, long time ago this morning at 8.30, uh, this morning. But there was a sense in, in the hearts of many that God was wanting to, to do something on the inside of us, setting captives free, bringing healing to our bodies. And I also think God wants to fill us afresh by his Holy Spirit. Can I tell you a cool story? A number of weeks ago in our service, I think maybe two months ago, two and a half months ago, we were talking about the Holy Spirit as kind of a side point to our sermon. But at the end of the sermon, we invited people and said, hey, if you've never received the filling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we'd like to pray for you this morning. And so we had some people respond to us, and it was so great. We prayed, we laid hands on them as the Bible would tell us to do. Prayed God would fill them. And in that moment, there was nothing flashy that happened. But at least two of the people came back to me and said, guess what happened to me this week? I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I began to speak in a spiritual language that, I, that, that God gave me. We sometimes call that speaking in tongues. But here's the thing. God wants to fill us with His Spirit so there's something to pour out. So this is what I want to do this morning. 
is I want to give you an opportunity even to A, even from where you are, Deanna and Gwen will lead us in some singing and they'll just give us an opportunity for you just to come before Jesus and say, Lord, I need filling today. I want to, at least would we can, let's take some moments in the presence of the Lord. If there's a dry area in you, would you ask the Lord? And again, you might think, well, I'll just pray later about it. Well, no, guess what? You probably won't and I'm not saying that to be mean. I just know me too. But now is a great time to pray, isn't it? It's a good Christian habit. When people say, would you pray for me for this thing? Pray right then because you probably, like me, are forgetful and might not pray about it later. So why not now? So why not now at least let's take a moment to come to Jesus and say, Lord, I want things to flow out of my life, but I realize, Lord, I need some input. Would you come fill me with the things you, need for me, you want to put in me today? Let's take some time in his presence. But I also want to give you an opportunity. Perhaps you actually want specific prayer. Well, A, for healing. And so what I want to do is over here, I'm going to stand and I'm going to be ready to come and pray uh, for people for healing. And if you, if you need that in your body, we want to lay hands on you according to Mark chapter 16. The Bible t tells us that the followers of Jesus will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. It's not just some weird charismatic or four square Pentecostal thing. It's the Bible tells us to do this. So we want to give you opportunity. If you, need need, if you have a need in your body for healing, we want to pray for you. Also, because of John chapter 7, I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's there, but He wants to fill you to overflowing. We also want to lay hands on you to pray God would fill you. And, and maybe you have been filled in the past, but you're just feeling a bit thirsty and you want the Lord to fill you fresh. Then we also want to have an opportunity to lay hands on you and pray according to the Scriptures because uh, God likes us to do the things the Scriptures tell us to do. Amen? So, hey, Tanya, come on down. Would you could come on over? Hey, Usko, can I put you on the spot? We're putting... We're, we're ratifying him for counseling. He can come pray, right? Come on. <laughs> but let's just spread out across the front. Can we stand together? I want to pray for us. And then as we worship, I want to invite you to come and we'll respond to just a moment of prayer. As people come, if you're like, what's this all about? If you come to any one of us, they're just going to lay their hand maybe on their shoulder. They'll ask what you want prayer for. And then they're just going to pray in faith. It's not that anyone is like the spiritual A team or anything, but I just... Wanted to kind of ask a few to come and join in, in that and then give the rest of us the opportunity to receive and respond this morning. But can we bow our heads and pray as we wrap up and then to give some time for us to come to Jesus this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the ways that you're wanting to lead us to life. And God, I pray that even for each person in this room, you're speaking to them today saying you want us to live. Would we live? And one of the ways that you want to bring life to us is by allowing that process of flow to happen where we're receiving from you, but we're also giving out for the sake of others. Never only just for our needs, but also there's always more than enough left for somebody else. And so, God, I pray that even today, the next few weeks, would you realign us? Would you let things flow that have been blocked up? God, I come against every blockage in our hearts and our minds that have prevented us from giving out what you've put in. I pray against every lie of the enemy that has stopped us up. And Lord, I say, uh, just in the name of Jesus, I declare that flow would begin to happen. Lord, that life would begin to, 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 to flow in greater levels than ever before. And Lord, I also pray today that as we come to you, King Jesus, for a fresh filling, would you meet our areas of thirst today? Because you said that anyone that's thirsty can come to you and drink. God, we thank you that even still today we get to come to you by faith and receive. So help us to receive the things that we need for you in our from you in our time of need. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place, in our church, in our lives, bringing life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And God's people said, amen. So what's going to happen, just like I said, Deanna and Gwen are going to lead us in some worship. If you just want to continue in your seat, you may sit, stand, kneel, whatever you need. But let's take some time to say, Jesus, I need you to fill me today. If you need specific prayer, we're ready here at the front. We'd love to pray with you this morning before you go. Again, I preach real short to leave some extra time for this this morning. So let's not worry. Lunch will come when lunch comes. But let's take some time to respond to Jesus. Can somebody say amen to that? And once you, when you feel you're ready to go, 
be blessed. You may be dismissed. We love you. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at the AGM. But if not, we love, look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we have this opportunity to seek the Lord. We love you. It's so great to have seen you today. I'm so grateful for what God is doing, has done, and will yet do in your heart and your life, even this morning, this afternoon. But bless you. Let's take some time to come to Jesus.